I would like to invite the Prime Minister to give her a Yeah, yeah. yeah. Because it is unfair because you are forcing someone 
someone to reciprocate as in forcing someone to give up his belief or her belief but you yourself as in the Muslim relationship doesn't have to you know give up his uh, his or her belief and it's when we think it is highly unfair see that uh, okay. then secondly this whole idea uh, secondly this whole idea of you know um, not secondly I'm, I'm moving on to my second level argument actually first is uh, secondly I give to speaker that this whole idea of religion itself is in, in Malaysia everyone is entitled to you know, exercise religion freedom of religion i.e. you can be a Muslim you can be uh, you know uh, uh, practicing Hindu or Buddhist and stuff like that right but sadly all this is only recognized if you as an individual but the moment you want to marry another person you have to convert out so we argue necessarily that you imposing freedom of religion based on uh, based on entity is something that is not right religion should be fundamental and exist you as an individual not you in exist uh, uh, exist as an entity or when you with another individual to begin with and it's when we think it is unfair so then we argue with the speaker that why freedom of religion or your right to such a religion must be based on individual per se regardless of who you are we argue necessarily this is important because it is a form of self-actualization it is a yeah. form of you pursuing yeah. your happiness and, th- and you know fulfilling your belief and practicing what you want and what you believe is speaker you want you be someone and this is when you cannot practice that belief this is when you think it is harmful and it's torturous for that person to speaker to be in a relationship and also you know not be able to practice their religion so then we argue to speaker the second argumentation this we argue that this will create better stability in the family itself why because when we have to be uh, when we have to believe this speaker we argue necessarily that we can see there might be two concurrent beliefs in existence in the family itself but we say it's okay because this is when the children will be beneficial with this kind of uh, under this paradigm i.e. now they will be taught with two different religions and this is when they will be more informed and be able to make decisions speaker yeah, on yeah. which religion that they want to choose and hence we don't see how this is bad for the family itself so then we argue so then we argue this in fact a form of empowerment on the third argumentation speaker on how this will create unnecessary clash of pride because we think this speaker marriage is a right everyone should be entitled to get married but we also think that religion is also a right to speaker on how everyone should be entitled to believe in whatever that they want to and when you put one as a definition to another this is when you create a clash of pride and we think in this context this clash of pride is unnecessary we don't see any benefits we don't see any justification for you to create or to for someone to choose one over the other to speak up and it's like it's awful so what i've talked to you about uh, uh to speak up, i've told you how it's very important for us to you know empower a person with right to religion and also right to marriage and i've told you how it will be torturous and harmful for you to force someone to convert out of religion just because they want to get married thank you I would like to thank the Prime Minister for his speech. Now I'd like to invite the leader of Fox to open the comment for the opposition. Okay. Oh, the irony, Mr. Speaker. Team John Curry is coming up to be the lions of Islam. Yeah. Stand against the infidels, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> we became this simple stance. States should recognize and respect the values of religious communities. And by that, our position in this debate is a direct opposite to that. We essentially say we should retain the prerequisite that non-Muslims should convert to Islam if they want to marry a Muslim for their religion, to, for their marriage, sorry, to be recognized by the state. Now, we're going to put a bit of a modification to the status quo. The status quo is currently that to marry a Muslim, you have to convert uh, for recognition. We say we'll keep everything like consent, informed choice, and they have to be above the age of majority. The context of Malaysia, though, what we're going to change is we're going to modify and remove all barriers that prevent religious conversion in the state. Essentially, individuals can choose to leave Islam, but if you subscribe to a certain community, if you make the choice to be in the belief system, if you say, I want to be a Muslim, we say the state has to respect 
therefore, the, the rules and the values of the community that you've chosen to join. So we respect the individual right, individual right to move between communities, but if you choose to call yourself a Muslim, if you want to retain your faith, you can't go and we will not recognize a marriage with you calling yourself a Muslim and marrying a Hindu. Indians are just a religion, sir. Right? More than that, right? More than that we say, we accept, we accept that alternatives can exist. If individuals really have a problem with taking the institution of marriage up, we say, or they, they really want to be married, they can take legal structures like prenuptials or civil unions or contracts, Mr. Speaker, or they can continue to get married overseas. But we say there is an important value in retaining the status quo, albeit with this minor modification. Now, I'm going to talk about this on three levels. I'm going to talk about um, acceptable, how this is an acceptable prerequisite within marriage. Secondly, I want to talk about the freedom of religion and how it should be respected, and, they, and we agree with them. Freedom of religion should be respected, they're impinging on it. And finally, I want to talk about respecting a community's view, particularly in the, the purview of religious communities. What NC, my second speaker, is going to talk about is the children and how this proposal will fundamentally harm them. Now, most of my rebuttals will be intertwined in my material, but there's one thing I want to deal with separately. When she came out and said there's more stability in the family, we beg to disagree. If the two counter, you know, if the two count, they say people are more informed. What we think is more likely to happen is a competition. A competition to win the child over to a certain faith where parents back each other. Yes. And even if it's not the parents, take into account, take into account the fact that there will be families families who subscribe to the faith, or family members who have various degrees of devotion to the faith, and they will be involved with their children. This sort of choice isn't going to lead to more information, but more confusion. Let's go into my first point, Mary. The first point about this debate. Sit down. On the idea of how this is an acceptable prerequisite within marriage. Now we say, fundamentally, what they ignore, and what I wanted to ask for them in the POI is this. You are not forced to get married. Marriage is a choice that you make to choose to be with someone for the rest of your life. Now you also accept when you are going to be with that someone, that choice has consequences. Those consequences, to a large extent, have to do with uh, the background that person comes from. If I make the choice to marry someone who comes from a family that requires me to pay a dowry, I have to fa face the consequence of that choice. Now, fundamentally, the way they make it seem, because this is the thing, they talk about it being a restriction of choice. It's not a restriction of choice. It's a limitation of a consequence. You're not saying that someone can't make a choice, because the truth is, you can. You just have to convert to Islam if you choose to marry a Muslim. If that person has made the choice to stay within the community, they have to bear the consequences. Their proposal removes the consequence of any choice. We say particularly in Asian and Malaysian culture, there are a lot of things you take on when you get married, Mr. Speaker. The practices of dowries, the practices of ceremonies. And we say, therefore, the burden of choice and consequence exists already in the status quo. This is just the state recognizing it. And these prerequisites are there for purpose. You have to stay a Muslim, Mr. Speaker, when you get married to a non-Muslim, because your faith will be your, your faith is strengthened by being with someone who did believe in the same thing. No. Keep in mind that all religious communities value the, in the relationship between the individual and God, or Allah, in this case, Mr. Speaker, then they value the relationship between two individuals. Mm. Jesus or Muhammad, all of them talked about their, pro their prophets or followers leaving families, leaving wives to follow them, Mr. Speaker, to fight in wars, to fight for the religion. So the value between God and religion is always put above. What you're doing is saying that consequence, that value of that community doesn't matter, but it's important to that community. And and therefore, we say marrying just marrying someone from another religion dilutes this. Yes, ma'am. Look, we're not giving an informed choice. When you're pushing this person into a corner, we're forcing them to choose their right or their left arm. Even more, what do you say about interracial marriages? If I'm wearing any, you have to wear a sari all the time as well. By your analogy. Yes, but uh, sorry is a cultural element. This is a religious element of belief. The community says to be a Muslim, you have to be someone, you know, to, to be a Muslim, you have to believe in the faith. There are rules in the Quran that say you can't be married to someone from a different faith. So that's a, that is the difference here. There is cultural definitions have no set rules. They have no scriptures. And that goes nicely to my second point. Freedom of religion should be respected. Because we say this, religion comes from an established set of beliefs. It comes from an organization that's there. That's why you, I can't start something on my own tomorrow and go, this is the church of Kate. I would like my tax exemptions for religion please. The state recognized religion and the freedom of religion. If you take into account the First Amendment, it wasn't about whether the state should or should not accept ex expression. What it takes into account is the state not making laws against religion or limiting it. What are you doing in this case? You are essentially saying that a community doesn't have the right to believe it. What you're saying is what people want, what they've established as their faith, 
what they recognize as their institution, you don't respect that. That community is not respected. More than that, what we say is that the religious institutions are fundamentally involved in marriage. They go through marriage counseling, they teach them about what the values of marriage are. Under your paradigm, does now a mosque have to tell someone all the bits that say about non-believers burning in hell, do they have to exempt that from their marriage training? Do we have to muzzle their freedom of expression? Because that's what your choice does. In the case there's a consensual choice, we say accept the consequences of being in a community. Yeah. Finally, we say we need to respect the view of communities. Religion and marriage is something that was like marriage is a religious institution that was brought into the state, not vice versa. It was something that religion defined as a bond between a man and woman. And we recognize and respect majority views and majority sensibilities across the world, even in Western liberal democracies. Take into account the Defense of Marriage Act that Bill Clinton, a Democrat, was then signed into power in 1996. Fundamentally, we say, your view doesn't respect the fact that this community has strong beliefs in this direction. Mr. Speaker, cons choices have consequences. And if you choose to join the community, there are, there are good things that come from that, but there are consequences. Don't let them make it, make it a situation where you can have it safe and eat it too. Thank you. Yeah. I would like to thank the Arrow for his speech. I would like to invite the Deputy Prime Minister to give you the Mr. Speaker, let me just address the nostalgic feeling, you know, I'm getting right now listening to, you know, my senior Tate speak again. It was a great pleasure. But, you know, I really appreciate it, but I'm not happy with the way he was dealing with the issue here. Because he wants you to believe that the way state, as in the Malaysian government, is treating Islam is the way the Malaysian government is treating Hinduism is the way that Malaysian government is treating Buddhism and Christianity within yeah. Malaysia. And we say that this is not the case. And we say that this is the main issue, Mr. Speaker. We believe that because the government is getting involved in this issue personally and maintaining this law, the government is actually allowing one religion to be preserved above other religions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It is favoring one religion above the other. Because we see, when a person is making... Let's talk about why this is not... What the current proposal state is not a pro-choice decision. The first thing is when a person is forced to leave his own religion, he first of all isolates his whole family, his own lifestyle, and agrees to come on, you know, in the case of marriage. However, we don't see this being extended to other religions, Mrs. B. We see that when a Hindu has to, you know, for example, marry a Muslim, it's only the Hindu conversion that matters to us. It, the other side doesn't. So it's always encouraging Siddha. I'll address you guys later. The issue is that, you know, we do not, we, we always see that, you know, it's one-sided. The person has to leave everything and, you know, join the religion. We say that when a person is making a decision, it is not fair. Why should one person have to be giving up everything in the process, whereas one person has to give up nothing? And we say that that is where the bias exists. It has to be an equal footing, you know? And we, can, we say that we can only achieve an equal footing if we leave it at a personal level. If we allow the government to be excluded from this process, let the couples discuss it amongst themselves, yeah, yeah. and let the law recognize it as a legal, civil, Malaysian marriage. Whether it's Islamic, it's Islamic or not, that's another issue, and that we leave up to the consenting parties. But before that, let's, with that established, Mr. Speaker, let's move on to this idea of a stability of marriage and, and you know, this idea of couples backing each other. We say that that's a very big problem and that really doesn't happen. What happens is this, Mr. Speaker. One person has to give up everything to enter Islam. Now, how is this new person's knowledge of Islam? Well, obviously, the person who is a Muslim has an informational advantage about the religion. He knows all the quicks and quirks and the laws and things like that. Where does the person learn religion from? Her spouse. And we say that the spouse can take advantage of the situation and teach religion in a biased way. Something we see a lot happening, you know, in these developing countries. We see the husband teaching the woman that you should stay home. This is an Islamic value when indeed it isn't. We see that, you know, culture is so intertwined with religion. We see an avenue of bias existing. And we said that their idea, this ideal notion that they back each other is not true. It's just that one person has an advantage over another and can exploit that person 
as, as a result. So we see that, you know, these consequences that they are talking about is not fair, Mr. Speaker, and this is my two levels of rebuttal. I'm going to go into substantive and I'm going to talk about two levels. First of all, societal integration in light of this whole idea of the cliché one Malaysia. And the second thing I want to talk about is what are the government's duties in this process? What is the yardstick for the government getting involved in this? But let me talk about the second one first, the government's right to be involved. But before that, take Sir, you pointed out earlier that your issue is that it's not equally applied to any other religions. Yeah. We're quite happy to have a world in which everyone has to follow this rule. It's just that Islam is the one that requires it right now. Would you be happy with a world where that happens? The problem is that we can issue this address, we can you know, address this issue by actually having the people consenting at a, at, the, uh, at a personal level. We don't need the government defining what should an Islamic marriage be. Why can't we just leave it and simplify the process by allowing these adults to decide what is religion and what is not, and what is an acceptable marriage or not? We're empowering citizens here. Why should we allow the government to do this? And let me go into my point directly because of this. The government's right to be involved, Mr. Speaker. We say that the government is promoting pro Bumiputra, pro Malay ag an agenda here, being the majority partner uh, party. It's trying to maintain this, you know, political significance and relevance to these kind of laws. Because let me explain the yardstick for government intervention, although it's debating one on one. First of all, the government may intervene in a marriage for the first reason that is instilling compulsory positive values. We don't see how the government is doing this in the case of Islam. What are these positive values that they're trying to force into a marriage? Is it that Islam has a better marriage contract than other religions? We don't know. We see a bias in there. The second reason a government can get involved is the fact that they have to prevent some sort of harm, Mr. Speaker. Even now, we don't see what is the harm of an Islamic marriage. Does the government really need to come in and say, no, that you have to do this? So we don't see any relevance or yardstick or precedent set. I mean, we see a very clear harm example in the case of, for example, AIDS. You have to take a prerequisite test for AIDS because it harms your spouse. We do not see any form of extension coming in this case. So we don't see any basis for the government intervening in this process and you know, affecting negatively this, this, this beautiful process. Right, now, I also heard this idea of, you know, his second speech, the second speaker is gonna be talking about this idea of the child, the benefit of the child. Let me tell you in advance the benefits of the child because we say that when two parents from two different religions are married together, we say that the child has a more informed choice in choosing a religion. If, for example, I already proved that when a child comes, enters into a religion, we have a problem now because one person knows everything about the religion, the other person doesn't. And one of the problems that we see youth facing today is they're forced to take their parents' religion because religion is taught in a biased way. We say that our model can remove this problem. What we are creating, in effect, is an informed group of people who know what is religion and we are empowering choice at a very high level. Thirdly, let me deal with this idea of societal integration and I'm leaving this for the last because it's the most easy. But the issue is integration of one Malaysia at this point. When we see that such a law exists, it creates tension between people because you see, I know many of my friends, all right, say their parents who tell them that, look, you can date anybody as long as he's not a, as long as he's not a Muslim because of this conversion law. Why is that restriction there? We say that this is what creates a barrier. You can date anyone except a Muslim because he's going to force you to convert. Similarly, Muslims say you can only marry a Muslim because they understand the religion. It's very hard. Don't give everything because they'll force you to commit outside the marriage. So we say that because of these things, societal integration does not take place. It harms it at the grassroots level, Mr. Speaker. So with that, we say that the proposition should go through. And with that, we beg to propose. Yeah, yeah. I'd like to thank the DPM for his speech. I'd like to invite the DLO to take this one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
They just said, they see, if, even if there's a different religious, they're just informed and children will be happy in the context. But that's not happening in the stress conscious the speaker. Yeah. Because they just ignore what is the religious, what is the impact on the children. Which is my first argument. Before we move on my first argument, I'm going to borrow some of the cases from the government here. They just said we are just like the Muslims, right? We just said we just treat Malaysian people as Muslim way. This is not true, Mr. Speaker. We just train every little people. We just respect freedom of choice of the peoples, right? We just happy give the Christian right to convert people marry if the Christian lives that is on his procedure because we believe everybody if you want to be in this religious you must follow some kind of rules of religion. That is the stance you want to pursue in the future things. And secondly, they said like it is kind of like oh. They just ignore my first speaker's argument, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That he said, if you want to be in some kind of religious, you must follow some rules because we always provide a lot of benefit to the religious people, right? We can come to my place, we can pray in my rooms, right? This is the thing we provide benefit to the religious people. But they just said, even if you can get a lot of benefit, if you want to marry with others, we just ignore Muslims and the other person's rules. I think this is ignore their first point. And thirdly, they talk about this unfair the person to have to convert, right? I have a three response. First, individuals that like individuals like citizens can have in our like marriage, yeah, right? Yeah. Because like Muslim can convert yeah. with other religions. Yeah, and yeah. two peoples can convert into the eight religion if, if they don't like their religious people yeah, yeah. just because there's marriage. They just ignore this fact. No, they, like their second speaker just talk about there is a bias. I have like but right? They just there is no harm. But I will explain why does it become to the children in my first argument. The first argument harm harm to the children. The reasons why they don't convert because they are so religious, right? They want they practice their religious at the marriages. So what is the consequence of that practice and belief of religion to their children, right? Children will have two different kinds of education, right? One day, father comes to my room and say, this is a religion you must believe. The other day, my mom comes to my room, no, 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 this is the religion you must believe. And what is the problem of these procedures, right? Because religious always say, my religion is absolute and the other religions cannot be English at the first place. They said, the Muslims said, the way of a good religious people is circumcision, right? And the Christians say, the way of good religious people is baptism. Then they cannot be exist at the same moment. Then what is the problem with the speaker? Always when they face the decisions, they just doubt themselves. Because my father say different. And I'm saying I'm doing something my mom's orders, I just contradicting with my father's like with my father's religious belief. I, I think this is a really big problem of their identity and their like yeah, concept yeah. of their own belief. Yes. Address the issue that when one person knows more about the religion than the person who's forced to convert, that there won't be any advantage play and there won't be conditioning at both levels, wife and child. No, like, I think they, they, they think their own argument, these people who grown up, they have their own like, decisions. Yeah, yeah. Now they say this is a biased education <laughs> knowledge. I think they just see <laughs> their cases. No, they have a grown up, they know their consequence, you must deal with their consequence. And moving on to my argument, right? Cause, and then they talk about like, the, if you go to Muslims, the Christian and other people should not exist. They just born in the hell. There's no place in the heavens. In fear of Christians, this is same education. And I come to my rooms and I see my father. Because my mom and my mom's religion said, your father was dead because your father does not have belief in my religion. This can happen. This can be big problems of identity in your family. Because whenever you meet your parents, which is most frequently meeting people, right? There is a problem. I doubt my father. I doubt my mother. I think that is really big problem. So what is the further problem, Mr. Speaker? Because when you have both religions, when you face and meet the community when you grow up, there is the problem. Why? If you live in a Muslim community with your mom's Christian belief, what is the problem? You cannot be 100% Muslim. Because someday you must go to church, right? At the same, you must go to mosque. 
then he must have a hard choice. Maybe he cannot choose anything. He just stay in your house, going anywhere. Then problems is happening from their friends and community. There will be discrimination from the community and friends, which must deal with your problems. Why? Like I said, religion should be absolute mm -hmm. to some of the people, and religion should be your way of your life. Like the debate, you must do the exactly the same thing your friends do in the community. If you do the different thing at the first day, they just treat you the freak because these different people with me. This is the big problem of the entire community. They just ignore at the first place. They just say there is happy moment because there is the same information from the parents. But the problem is you can get information from the internet, newspaper, anywhere. This not happen just only at inside of the parents. The problems of different like religious inside parents is there's a problem of identity. There's a problem of way of living. There's a problem of practicing their own religious and discrimination from the community. I think this is a big problem to the children we must like think about in this debate. Okay, Mr. Speaker, what have I told you today? They just like misrepresent our case. They just said we just like we just praise Muslims. No, we just treating every religious equal. We just respect like we just respect religious belief yeah, yeah. that it is the same as Christian, Muslim, and whatever. And people can convert into, into the other yeah, religions. Yeah. They have a choice in our matters. So I clearly talk about there's a problem of children, they just clearly do not at the first place. This is a problem because you meet the people, you think these people should burn in the hell. I think this is a problem. For those regions, I'm very proud of opposing this motion. religious belief. They want to propagate the idea of understanding the religious belief. But how do they want to propagate that idea? If you want to marry this person, you have to go and choose whether or not you are willing to convert yeah. or whether or not you're willing to let go of the one person that you will love for your whole entire life. So how is that an understanding of a religious belief, Mr. Chair? How is that understanding your religion or creating some sort of you know, tolerance within society when you're pushing one party into a corner to choose is like choosing between his right or left arm? We feel, Mr. Chair, understanding religion, understanding belief of religion is by tolerance and which is can actually be more accepted and be more logically reasonable, Mr. Chair, through our paradigm. When you have these two people living under one roof, Mr. Chair, not just living under one roof, but creating a family with that understanding between these two religions, Mr. Chair. They came up with these feasibility issues. They said, you know what, the child will be confused. Yeah. I just thought. So they'd be confused. It'll be a battle of religions, yeah, Mr. Yeah. Chair. You know, apparently the, the kids don't know how to choose. But in Malaysia, Mr. Chair, we see in status quo, you already have two religions living under one roof. When you see Christians marrying Hindus, when you see Hindus marrying Buddhists, Mr. Chair. So we feel that there is no clash of religion there. And yet we see society still accepting these people. And yet when the children actually grow up, and when they reach 18, they can make that decision. They said we were being hypocrites. said we were contradicting ourselves. Because why? Muslims, you know, you said that we, we, we stated that, that Muslims teach their, with their children in a biased manner. Yet on the other hand, we say that, you know, they can make their own choice. But Mr. Chair, what is the point of a biased manner? That means you have no other option. That means within a religious a Muslim family, Mr. Chair, you are thought the be all and end all of that is, is Islam. But when you come into a family with two faiths, Mr. Chair, there is an option. There is an option and there's another side to the story, there's a different side to the coin, Mr. Chair. That's what we mean by a bias in the bias faith, Mr. Chair, or bias teaching, as compared to actually having an informed choice at the very end of the day. Now, let's go into two main issues, Mr. Chair. Is it a fair and acceptable prerequisite? I'll go on this in two levels, Mr. Chair. Whether it's right to follow a community, and secondly, which best represents the freedom of religion. On the second yeah, yeah. level, Mr. Chair, does it create more harms that the side of opposition want to go and flurry about, right? So on the first issue, is it really fair and acceptable prerequisite? 
not the first contention that they had a problem with. They said, you know what? It's a really a fair and accepted period is it because you want to follow a community, right? That's what the community actually accepts itself, or sorry, surrenders itself to. So if you want to be part of that community, then you have to follow that yeah. ideology, right? Yeah. So first thing, Mr. Chair, what if you don't want to be part of that community? You don't marry a person because you want to be part of their community, Mr. Chair. You marry that person to go and start a family with them. So if by that analogy, Mr. Chair, by that point itself, if you want to marry an Indian, if I wanted to marry an Indian, Mr. Chair, I would have to probably eat curry every day. I probably have to drink tea. I probably yeah, have to wear the... No. <laughs> exactly. No, I would probably have to go and wear that black dot over my head, Mr. Chair. Yeah, sorry, I forgot the name. Yeah, black dot, uh, probably wear saris all the time because I'm, I'm accepting myself to a religious community, but that's not true. Why? Because that in itself, Mr. Chair, it's not an understanding of belief. That in itself is you forcing an ideology towards these people, Mr. Chair. We feel that the right understanding of belief comes with you realizing what your spouse needs. I think you need to stand. Understanding what your spouse really needs and understand, understand what your spouse actually believes in, in, Mr. Chair. We also see in this instance, Mr. Chair, that you know it's not just about dowries. We also see you know how a lot of these things are also culturally in, intertwined, Mr. Chair. So it's not necessarily that you have to go and follow because of the community, because of a religion, Mr. Chair. And especially when it comes to a matter of individual versus community, we feel that the individual has a better right and a larger right than Mr. Chair. Because he is the one who's bringing up his own family. We don't want resentment creating in that family, Mr. Chair. We want an understanding. We want to know that the couple themselves are there with a mutual understanding of what they're into, Mr. Chair. Not because I'm in your faith, because I have to go and sleep with you, or because I want to sleep with you, Mr. Chair. Yes, first of all. What are you saying to the Muslim community when you allow someone to call themselves a Muslim, but they're allowed to do something proscribed by Islam, that is marrying a non-believer? No, Mr. Chair. You say that these Muslims are the Muslims who actually want to try and understand Islam. These are the Muslims who want to challenge their faith, Mr. Chair, because in Islam all the time, we see there are challenges within faith. We see the different interpretations within Islam itself, or even wearing the headscarf, Mr. Chair, whether it's a contention or not, whether you have to go and cover your bosom, Mr. Chair, even that's also a contention in itself. Even now, Mr. Chair, even in the UK, where the British Muslims, Mr. Chair, the, 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 the Muslim Imams actually contest and say that, uh, uh, that homosexuality can actually to be accepted within Islam by a certain verse that he, he, he interpreted, right? So we feel, Mr. Chair, that it's an, it, all these contentions do exist even in Islam because it's an interpretation, a personal interpretation in Islam itself. It's also the same, you can say the same thing about a, a Muslim woman who does not wear a scarf. What do you say? How can you not wear a scarf and still call yourself a Muslim? It's all interpretation and what you really believe in at the very end of the day. We still, still say that this can still extend and still actually apply in this instance. On the second level, Mr. Chair, which actually best represents the freedom of religion. They say it does re best represent the freedom of religion because, hey, you can convert and that automatically means that the rest of you represents the freedom of religion. It doesn't, Mr. Yeah, Chair. Yeah. Because when you actually push these people into a corner, emotional blackmail, Mr. Chair, it's not best rep representing a, per a person's religion. Even more so, Mr. Chair, they will actually create more of a difficulty within these instances. Why? Because imagine the couples, Mr. Chair, who uh, non-Muslim converts into being a Muslim, but then they have a tiff, and then the, the Muslim, used to be non-Muslim, became a Muslim back again, Mr. Chair. How does that actually show a best representation of freedom of religion? You're just bouncing in and out of the religion itself, Mr. Chair. What does that say about Islam, Mr. Chair? What does that say about Islam and its values, Mr. Chair? And it also gives a wrong perception towards society. It gives the wrong perceptions that all these Chinese, you know, you don't actually, you can't go out with the Chinese yeah, because yeah. You'll, he'll marry yeah. you and then he'll leave you and convert and become a Buddhist again. You can't marry an Indian because when he becomes a Muslim, he'll become a Hindu again, again after that because you guys just don't understand each other. This is the thing that you want to avoid. And that, that's the thing, we're coming to my third point, I touched this very lightly, but whether it creates more harm than good. Because they, they come up and told us, they you know what, they, we already handled the situation about the confused child and the banking issues, Mr. Chair. We feel that this will not actually concede, this will not actually happen. Because we feel in an environment where there's more important choice, the child can be grow up and make his own decision. And if he can't choose, Mr. Chair, that is his own lifestyle. Because that is the way that, that, that is the way that the child interprets his own religion, and that's the way he can do it. If he wants to be an atheist at the very end of the day, that's his problem, Mr. Chair. But at least what we're doing is we're creating an avenue for this child to have two different sides yeah. of the story. So at least there's no biasness in this instance. At least he can make his own informed choice, Mr. Chair. So
So what did we tell him, right? You know, we told him that the community itself would accept these things at the very end of the day because it's an evolution of society, it's an evolution of norms, Mr. Chair, as we've seen it's gone past for decades and how culture has always evolved through time. Even more, Mr. Chair, we feel that this actually, this tolerance, this idea of tolerance and idea of understanding which can be best represented when both parties know what the religion is about. Yeah. Not by forcing it down into one yeah. group, forcing them to choose, Mr. Chair, and calling it freedom of religion. Yeah. We are fighting for freedom of religion, Mr. Chair. Make sure you understand each other. Don't force it down your throat. Thank you. Yeah. I'd like to thank the government for speech. I'd like to thank the government for summarizing the case for time. Mr. Chair, on the side of opposition, we are big advocates for respecting choice. Yeah, yeah. Whenever in my marriage something is forced down one of the spouse's throats, then they choose to do so, uh, going to be forced out. <laughs> so, uh, those are the things that we agree on at the start of the marriage. Um, ultimately, Mr. Chair, what we believe is that membership with the religious organization has privileges, but it also comes with consequences. Yeah. They talk about the state intervening. We think the state is intervening. It's intervening to uphold the rights of that religious organization. If you want to have membership in the religious organization, you need to follow those rules. No one says you must be. If yeah, you want yeah. to be recognized as a member of the religious organization, then you have to follow their rules. You can be this personal interpretation, you know, modernistic interpretation of Islam. Go ahead and do it. But if you want to come out there, you're going to say, I want to be part of this community. I yeah, want yeah. you to look at me as part of this community. I want a little card that says, I get the benefits. Oh, yeah, man. To be part of this community, then you have to follow the rules of that community, yeah, yeah. unfortunately. She said, you know, we're pushing one party to choose the left arm and the right arm. And see clearly, and clearly even just to clarify the start of the speech, we're not pushing one party over the other. We think this should apply to all religious organizations that insist that this should be a criteria. If the Hindus don't care, I mean, they've got a million gods, they're going to care about you know, which one is true, then good for them, right? But if the Christians care, the Jews care, and Jews do care, then we think that should, that should apply, we should inform across those things. And she said, choosing one arm over another, say, yes, you do. If you juggle with a chainsaw, you will eventually have to choose one arm over the other, right? So you have to, you have to take the consequences that come with that. What I'm going to do, Mr. Speaker, I'm going to look at this notion of when states are intervening. Then I'm going to talk about this notion of choice. Choice of the individuals, choice of those religious organizations. And I'm going, going to go over the uh, contribution that came out from our team and tell you why it's awesome. Yes, ma'am. But a person marries another person not because they want to be part of that community, but they want to be married to that person. So what if the person does not want to be part of that community at all? Why are you forcing them? I'm not. Then you can leave the community. If, the, you if, if, if you don't want to be part of the community, then leave. You yeah. see, the context, this debate only happens when religious people get married to other religious people. Because then you want to hold on to your religious faith. You want to be part of that, of that community, right? So I'm not forcing you to be part of the community. You choose. You are choosing to make conflicting choices. Yeah, you are yeah. saying that I want to eat two different things at the same time. But my mouth can't fit those two different things. Then I have to choose one thing over the other thing. That's just how it is. Because those choices conflict with one another. Because the alternative of that choice is the state has to tell that religious community that you can't practice religion the way you want to practice this yeah, religion. Yeah. When I asked the first speaker whether or not the state should make you know, females priests in the Islamic religion, she said, no, 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 they can't. They can have a different form of involvement and engagement. Yeah. It's personally consistent with what we are talking about. Right? Like, you can be, you can, you, can get, you can get married to a civil union, you can write a contract with, with each other, yeah. but you cannot say that I want this faith to go against their tenets of what this community believes in in order for my personal wishes. Because I'm like a futuristic Muslim and I want to be cool, right? Be cool on your own level and don't make other people be as cool as you are. Right? So, first thing on this notion, no thank you, of the states upholding when the states intervene, we said let's recognize the context that this happens when people care about the religious faith and in countries where the religious community holds political sway. If both of these things were not true, Mr. Speaker, this debate would not happen, right? And the states are upholding the rules of the religious organization, they're not forcing other people to do something, they're not. They're forcing people to abide by their own beliefs. Yeah, right? Beliefs yeah. that they themselves prescribe, yeah. that they themselves want to hold up to, right? And this notion that, and, and we're quite upset because they said states intervene when there's harm. And they talk about HIV and all those things. I think NC brought like, quite a lot of harm in the speech. I don't think there was, there was any response to that harm. Uh, she said in the speech, the child can make an informed choice to choose one religion over the other. And this is a little bit weird. The child can make, can make an informed choice at age seven about whether or not he wants to do this or not. But the individuals who are like grown up, right, they are pressured to convert one religion to another. They're sweating and no 
what to do. I think these are very mature children on that side of the house. It was a very immature adult. There's a little bit of Benjamin Button going on. I think that's the issue. That's the best look at this notion of respect of choice or individuals first thing. As I say, members have privileges and they come with consequences. If you want a personal interpretation, that interpretation happens personally. We don't, we don't stop people from reading the Bible at home, from proclaiming themselves their Christians. Exactly. Like, like many Christians do in China, but they never force their government to recognize that this church exists. So if you want to get, if you don't want a religious marriage, if you don't want a religious marriage, get a civil union, have a contract with one another. But if you want your marriage to be recognized, and the state said that marriage is a religious uh, concept that was brought and recognized by the state, yeah, yeah. one that sort of recognition, you have to follow the rules. Sir. They said they talk about pressures to convert. Pressures to convert happen when religious people want to get married to one another. Because I want my, I want to maintain my religious faith. My religious faith says that this is how I should bring up my child. The conflict with your religion religious faith, those conflicts and stuff will happen. It happens to everyone. We think those individuals need to make those choices and the state shouldn't come in and say, you are not allowed to enforce this choice, you are not allowed to enforce this choice. The state should say, if those are the rules of the religious organization, I'm going to enforce those rules. Moving on to then the religious organizations. As I've already clarified, the states are not imposing these things, right? They said, uh, the second speaker said, look, the governments can't come in there and tell them what to do. He's making it seem like the government is defining what the religious yeah, yeah. laws are. Yeah. They aren't. If the majority of Muslims wanted to change the way Islam is being imposed or run in the country, I have a feeling they would be able to do that. Right? They like the way those things are happening yeah, right yeah. now. And we think, let that happen in that way. It's not the same as culture. Because it's not the same scale, firstly. The culture doesn't say you have to do these things in order to do those things. So thank you, ladies and gentlemen. But secondly, we say it's also not a rule. Those things that she talked about, those examples about dressing and wearing photos, those are not rules to be part of that culture. But if you try to eat beef, let's say, in part of your home, that's going to not go down well with your in-laws, man. Let me tell you that. Right? So that, that becomes a little bit of an issue. So there are, of course, distinctions. There are, of course, scales. We're not saying you have the status to go in there and do every single thing and make sure people dress in a Muslim way or a Muslim context. But if that is a religious rule, if the religious organization themselves think that this is important, they say many people who want to be part of our community need to follow these things. If those individuals want to maintain themselves as part of that community, want to get a marriage ordained by someone who's in that community, they want a priest, they want, they want all those things, then they have to follow the rules. That's unfortunate. Otherwise, do as what we said at the start of this house and leave. And that's what Tate said, which they yeah, largely yeah. ignore. Individuals should be allowed to change their religion. They should be able to leave their religion. We should have civil and legal alternatives to maintain the unions without the religion. He said this is an acceptable prerequisite, right? Which wasn't necessarily contended. We talked about how this respects the values of that organization. We are happy on one hand to say, let's not change all these organizations, but we want to change this without necessarily saying why we will change this without all of those things. We don't want to change those organizations. We neither want to change those individuals. We respect them. We think that they should be fully aware of the consequences of their choices. You choose to be part of the organization, Mr. Speaker, and to follow the rules of that organization. Very happy to yeah. someone has to cut off their left arm or their right arm. We pointed out early on, both in the form of NCs to battle and also more comprehensively in Logan's speech and the alternative they are given, that no one has to choose to cut off their left and right hand. It's not a one-way street. The person who is Muslim can convert to the, the religion of the other person, as NC pointed out. Those two people could both choose to convert to another religion altogether, where it's fair, or two religions altogether, where it's fair for them to marry each other. So to a large extent, 
The key step of words that they prove you with the needle of matter, Mr. Speaker, the first speaker and the third speaker, where they were going, it's choice. It's unfair to one party. It's an overriding of personal choice. All of that is irrelevant in today's debate. The choice is exercise. The choice that you're exercising is the choice to get into a community. And we sit on our side and maintain it down the line. That choice has consequences. What they're choosing is this, because their paradigm is this. They're going, in the case where there is choice and conflict because of choice, because you feel like, oh, I want to be a Muslim, but I want to marry this person who's not a Muslim too. They're saying you shouldn't have to face the consequence of that. We're saying you should. Their cost of it, therefore, Mr. Speaker, and this is where they came and started really engaging with us on the second speaker, was this, a state bar for intervention. What is the state's relationship to religions? And I think this is where this debate is actually going to, you know, this, I hate to use the word, that's what the debate is going to boil down to. Where does the state intervene with religion? What they've essentially tried to argue in the second speaker's speech primarily, because the whip seemed to drop it off, right, was this idea that the state basis for intervention should purely be on the basis when there is harm, when there is something that is harmful to society. Firstly, we pointed out in my own speech that that's not the test that's there. I talked about the Defense of Marriage Act, I talked about cultural sensibilities. None of that was responded to. What they've maintained the right is basically for someone, and I asked them this in a POI, and also in my speech, and Logan brought this back in. They think that someone should have the right to call themselves a Muslim, to be an affront to the faith and the community that they claim to be a part of, even though that community proscribes marriage to someone outside that. We, your neutral position isn't a position where the state isn't intervening. It is intervening. It's taking the side of the individual. But they've chosen to shy away from that burden. They've chosen to shy away from defending the fact that what's happening in this case is the state is saying the religion is invalid. And this was the material in my second argument that he didn't deal with, that the second did deal with. This idea that in the freedom of religion, individuals or when two individuals of different religions get married to each other, fundamentally the church is forced to take a position of not saying that that's harmful if there's religious counseling going on, if the religious institution is there. More so, we say, within the concept of how the state relates to religion, we must have balance. The balance is in this level. Individuals make choices to enter and leave communities at will. If they make the choice to enter a community though, they cannot choose to then take pieces of that community and say, I only want it this way. There are consequences because the price, the price of being able to take those bits and pieces is the ability to widen the sensibilities and the values of the community. And the state must uphold the that as well. Finally, they talked about social cost and the social issues that come about. We pointed out firstly that in the, as much as you talk about benefits in terms of one nation, what is more likely is the paradigm that NC brought to you. And he explained that quite clearly in terms of how conflict can arise at home. I also added material to that, or preempted some of the material, by talking about it in my rebuttal about how conflicts arise not necessarily from parents, but also from other relatives within the family. So, in conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, we support choice. We respect the right of things and entities that exist in society. They choose to recognize only one half of that, the individual. We recognize individuals, we recognize communities. We're proud to oppose. Mr. Speaker, the feeling of nostalgia I mentioned before is quickly dissipating because I was used to losing to them. And I'm starting to think maybe things are going to change here. Because let's see who really missed the boat. I think a very confused, contradictory stand came from, from the opposition today. Because, you see, on the one hand they say that state mandatory acts are required to ensure that religion exists. At the same time they say that people have the choice to choose these religions. And we say that this is the problem. Because you see, what they have is a very similar, a very simple approach, a substitutionist approach. Let's call it that. If you want to take one religion, you do have to cut off the other arm. Their case actually proposes that because they stand up for the law. If you want to take one religion, you have to give up the other one. It's one or the other. I don't understand how their case is actually proposing religious pluralism. I don't understand how religious conditioning by the husband to the wife or wife to the husband as a result of a conversion, how that leads to freedom of religion. I don't understand, Mr. Speaker, how when one parent is teaching one religion to a child, that allows plurality of religion to enter the child. 
all they did to deal with that problem, which is supposed to be the trump card and you know the second speaker's speech, I say that is a big problem because the child only experiences one religion and that from the eyes of that one parent who defends that religion. And we say that that is a very big problem. We brought a more rational case to you, Mr. Speaker. But in order to understand that rational case, I have to ask you one question. Can two religions exist with each other from two different spouses and a marriage continue? This is the question. And we say that it is very reasonable and we can see plenty of examples existing in the West where these laws are not enforced. We see that people from different religions are indeed getting married. And their children are not as confused as their second speaker. We can take it to be an excep exceptional case perhaps. But we see that, you know, these people are growing with informed choices. We see that religion is reaching views at multiple levels. They can experience different religions and choose when it's time to make the decision. The idea of these people having access is about going to different schools or access to different schools of religion. So we see that being proposed nicely in our argument and not being dealt with enough. But the second thing we wanted to talk about is that should, this is what the debate was and this is what they missed, should marriage really be conditional to religion? Because when a person chooses to accept a, another religion, the marriage becomes contingent upon their choice. And that means a marriage can also not go through because of religion. Is that really a prerequisite of marriage? We defend religion as a right. And given that marriage is a right, can we really say that the government has the right to make sure that religion acts as a barrier to, to marriage? And we say that that is the problem, this idea of exclusion. We say that the definition of religion is not state-mandated mandate, as they say. We say the definition of religion is personal. If we decide that we want to get married for whatever religion we choose, whoever wants to be whatever religion, that is our personal decision. The government doesn't have to label our marriage as Islamic or not. Let us face the consequences with society, but let us make the choice. This is the heart and spirit of what we are representing, Mr. Speaker. We are taking that choice away from the government and putting it in the hands of people. We're empowering individuals and as a benefit of those, we are creating religious pluralism, understanding of religion, and multi, you know, integration at a level which is supporting one Malaysia. So I see a very big problem coming from them. I think a very half-assed approach was taken by them, and they didn't deal with the whole thing because on the one hand they say that religion should be protected by the government. On the other hand, you know, they say that you know you. We, we, we are allowing pluralism. We don't see that happening. And the basis of that is very simple. The basis of it is very simple. We have different people, uh, kids are getting confused and people are getting confused with multiple religions. I don't think that's enough for that, the pendulum to swing in their favor. With that, we're going to propose. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm going to thank you guys for the debate.